you know there's some important conversations and topics you need to be discussing with your tween and teen kids, but sometimes it can seem overwhelming or it can make you nervous as to where even to begin with that. I'm Julie Lyles Carr, the host of the Modern Motherhood podcast from All Mom Does, and today I welcome Dana Gresh, who has a whole ministry designed to create experiences for you and your middle school and high school student to connect and converse about some of today's most important issues. So I think you're going to learn so much today from her. Dana, thank you so much for being with us. It's my honor. So excited. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a mom of three and love them like crazy, but they left the nest. Uh, I'm now a mom of about 32 farm critters <laughs> that cuddle with me and love me until I have grandbabies. But um, I live on a hobby farm with llamas and peacocks and fainting goats and horses. And that's probably, if I get to pick where I could be every day, it would be out there in the pasture with those critters. But I also love the ministry and work God's assigned to me. Walking with moms and teen girls and tween girls through some really important conversations. You know, my fourth child is now a professional llama keeper. Does that not <gasps> sound like the ultimate homeschool moment? What are your kids doing? Well, one's a one's a llama girl. <laughs> well, <laughs> totally. I want her to come and teach me how to groom, and I'm so bad at it. I, I once shaved them, and my husband said, never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've had a lot of fun getting to see Macy and her adventures in caring for these llamas. And uh, there are a lot of things I didn't know about llamas that now that I, I do. So I'm glad to hear that you are in the llama lane, too. That's very exciting to know that you're part of that tribe. So how did your work and focus on this type of ministry to moms and daughters, how did all of that begin? And I know that you particularly have some focuses on modesty and sexual morality and, and those kind of lanes. So how did all that get started for you? Well, probably the, the real answer would be my own brokenness. You know, when I was 15 and I loved the Lord like crazy, I was involved in my youth group. I was teacher for Child Evangelism Fellowship, I, everything right, right? Except I was in this relationship that I thought I could control and found out very quickly that I couldn't. And I, I got out of that relationship. I kind of stood before God and said, teach me to live a life of purity. But what I didn't do, and I regret greatly, was I never told anyone. I just carried that shame and that hurt all by myself for about 10 years. And it was really when my daughter was born, my first daughter, and she was six months old. And I'm driving down the highway listening to a program a lot like this one. And I heard an interviewer ask, what is the number one question on a teenage girl's mind when she's talking to her mom about sex? Without hesitation, the answer was the number one thing on her mind is, mom, did you wait? And that was a literal come to Jesus moment. I pulled to the side of the road and I allowed just 10 years of grief to engulf me. And the pain and the, the work of healing that pain that I wasn't willing to do for myself as a mama bear, I was willing to do it for my baby. And that just commenced this tremendous journey. You know, once you find healing from the Lord, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians that God heals us and comforts us so that we can comfort others with the same comfort we ourselves have received. So it just started pouring out on teenage girls at church. And then the next thing I know, I'm doing a retreat. And the next thing I know, I'm doing another retreat. And the next thing I know, I'm doing a retreat in another state. It was really just an organic work of God as he healed my heart and unleashed me to pass that healing on. I love that it began really with the idea of connecting these moms and daughters, because I think a lot of times we tend to want to separate those conversations, right? Like, okay, moms, well, let's go and let's deal with you and talk about what may have been in your past and how you want to make it different for your children. And then we circle up the kids and we, we teach these different messages, but we don't connect the two generations. What happens when you are intentional about attaching those generations for this kind of connection and conversation? Well, that's the most important thing. And so many times we do send kids off to the youth pastor or to the health class at a public school or whatever it may be for these important conversations. And we isolate moms and dads from these important conversations. But research really tells us that the number one risk reducer for everything our heart fears as parents, whether it's substance abuse, bad academic performance, unhealthy relationships, violence, um, codependency, 
early sexual debut, everything we fear, that the number one risk reducer is parent-child connectedness. Mom and dad being in the minutia of those conversations and, and being at the ready for those conversations. You know, the whole myth of quality time in parenting, that's just a lie. It takes quantity of time to have the quality. And that doesn't mean that whatever your school choice is or whatever you're a single mom and you have to work and you're not with your kids 24-7, that God can't give you the ability to have makeup time. It, it just means that your kids have to be a priority. God has given you them to parent for this season. And it is a blink of an eye season. You are so shocked when it's over and they are leaving the house to be llama take, caretakers, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, you just can't believe it. And, and so I just just encourage you that that is it. That's the whole kit and caboodle. When I found that out, my ministry was already off the ground. We were doing events for teenagers, 1,500 teenagers a night in these big churches with a worship band and my husband and I. When we found this piece of research, we completely restructured our ministry to do parent-child events. That's why our Secret Keeper Girl event is a mother-daughter event. At first, it was a big financial hit. Our event attendance went way down because now we're requiring both mom and daughter father and son to be available. But we believe so strongly that if parents are in the driver's seat of connecting to their kids, we can reduce the risk and their hearts can be safe. What are some of the trends that we need to know about as parents today? Because there may be moms and dads out there saying, "Ooh, I, I still feel like I want to leave this to the professionals. I really don't know that I want to get in the depths there and dig through. So what are some of the trends that we need to know that may necessitate, I think, necessitate us getting right in the middle of the game? Well, I could probably give you the top 10 trends, but one of them that I'm really concerned about, and I just am, I want to sound an alarm, is social media, is really increasing the risk of so many of these things, whether it's pornography or sexting or body image issues, eating disorders. Uh, let's just talk about the eating disorders and girls for a minute. Um, in 2006, when, when Facebook was making its debut, um, we were noticing that the that, that the average teenage girl was showing up on the anxiety scales in terms of her body image and beauty issues so high, the average teenage girl, that the average teenage girl would have been in in treatment program facility in the 50s and 60s for her body image issues and depression and, and eating disorders. So fast forward to 2016, and we have been able to clearly link social media to an increase in that, whereas the average age of an eating disorder patient was about 15 years old back in the year 2000, 2006. Um, now the average age is 10 years wow. old. Wow. Students, girls as young as five mm. being admitted. And we can link it directly to social media. And so um, I just really caution parents. So many parents just disregard the age limits and age restrictions on social media. It's illegal for any of the social mediums to acquire data from anyone under the age of 13. So if your child's not 13, really smart, important people have deemed it not emotionally safe environment for someone under that age. But I see kids under that age all the time on social media. And I hear the sad stories of parents who their son's using pornography and addicted to pornography because he started using whatever it medium it was when he was nine or 10 years old and they thought it was harmless and they thought it was okay or their daughter is struggling with an eating disorder or she's being bullied very severely bullied they're just not ready so I, I guess that's a big one and even after they are 13 I'm not sure if some of them are ready you have to measure you know your kid needs boundaries on social media I need boundaries on social media right so if your child is not demonstrating in-home responsibility about boundaries you have created like chores getting chores done in a timely manner homework finishing homework in a timely manner um, they're probably not emotionally ready and responsible enough to obey really important rules when it comes to social media so you have to think through that as parents but I think that's one of my big concerns right now I, th I am curious to get this from you, knowing that you are such a, you know, a valued voice in the space. You've had so much experience and you've seen so many things as you travel the country talking about this, writing about these issues. I'm finding it's interesting that, you know, 
I growing up in a Christian home myself, I just completely understood that the that God's best was that I wait for marriage. Like that, you know, that was just that was right up there with understanding there were not nine but ten commandments. That there were twelve, not seventeen disciples. Like it was just one of the tenets of being raised in a Christian home. And I'm not saying that that then turns actually into how someone chooses to make their choices and live their life, but it was very understood as part of that canon, if you will. And I'm finding that even the message of waiting until marriage is now becoming something that a lot of Christian homes aren't really teaching. Are you finding that to be true in your circles? And and what do we do about that? How do we go back and sort of equip a generation of parents to say, look, there are things that are God's best. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we definitely are seeing a trend where even if they have been told it, they haven't been told it enough, and they haven't been told it in a strong enough way or a compelling way, maybe it's just been a thou shalt not without parents talking about the blessings of waiting and why God says we should wait and the beauty of sex and the beauty of marriage and the meaning of it. Um, and so what we see is is teenagers and college students are entering into the real world and they're not behaving any differently from their non-Christian peers. The average college student will have about, the males will have 9.7 sexual partners but by the time they graduate college. Females will have 7.2 on average. And in the secular setting, we don't see any difference statistically between the Christian kids or the non-Christian kids. So that's really alarming. We're doing something wrong. We aren't telling the message well or adequately or compellingly enough, or maybe we're just not telling it. But today's young 20-somethings, they're living with Christians. They're living with their partners. They're engaging in as much sex as non-Christian kids. So we need to do something different. So as part of wanting to do something different, you have these different events that you do, you have times that you pull together, moms and daughters and things of that nature, and and you cover a lot of different things. I know that it's all the way from helping have those conversations and begin those chains of of what needs to be connection between parents and kids for this topic, to having fun and, and to having, you know, different components of the conversation. And one of the things that you do cover that I think is really interesting and is a hot topic in a sense is this definition of modesty. And, you know, modesty has a lot to do with cultural expectations, the current era, the attitude, and more. So how do you define modesty as you're helping equip parents with that verbiage? And does that definition carry over into other cultures and regions of the world? Where where do you land on that today? Well, I think the definition that does carry over into all cultures is modesty is presenting yourself appropriately. The word appropriate means okay. So it's not okay to wear a Speedo to perform in a piano recital, right? Not a good idea. That's not appropriate. It would be distracting. It's not okay to wear a prom dress to a bonfire. That would not be appropriate. And so um, I think that's a definition that girls are like, oh, okay, appropriate. It's okay. Um, It helps us to steer away from body shaming It helps us to steer away from some of the hot button issues that people are afraid of. I I still think that it's it's not appropriate for girls to wear skin tight yoga pants to school. It's not appropriate for her academic experience or for the academic experience of others around her. And so you take it from something that's purely just about her body and you make it about what is appropriate. And so, of course, that transcends to all cultures. What I don't like to do with modesty and what I've really worked hard at is creating hard and fast legalistic rules that your skirt should be this many inches above or below the knee or um, whatever the case may be. Because I find that that doesn't help a girl internalize the decision to be appropriate. All it does is get her stuck up on your rules And she doesn't go through the process in her heart, never mind, of looking in the mirror and saying, is the way I'm dressed appropriate? Now, for Christians, the word appropriate has some extra meaning because there's four times in the Bible that modesty is addressed. Every time it's addressed to women. That's why we tend to teach modesty to women more than we teach it to men because the Bible does. And also because women don't tend to have the same mind structure as men. When a man walks by without a shirt on, it may not be appropriate if he's in church. It's certainly not appropriate, but it might be appropriate if he's on a beach. But a a woman's not going to generally 
go crazy. Uh, that's not so true about men and women because women are this just we the, we don't use why do we use women's faces in ads for men's razors because women are beautiful and women are appealing so we address the teaching to women and the verses every single time have very little to do with our bodies and our sexuality it has all to do with the good works of our heart. Those verses say, I don't want anything about the outside of a Christian woman to distract from the good works and the beautiful character and the adornment of her internal heart. And so for a Christian woman, she looks in the mirror and says, is the way I'm dressed on the outside inappropriately going to distract from the way God's spirit has dressed me on the inside? I think it's fun because you have fashion shows as part of your events that help show that, hey, it's awesome to be sassy and fashionable and fun. This is not trying to, you know, tone down a lot of the plumage in a way that keeps some of the fun out of being a girl, but at the same time really helps demonstrate what those, what we want the heart to look like in that reflection of the inward to the outward. Now, you said that in your early mothering, you really had to come to terms with some of your past when you were 15. And you said it came from these secrets that you had never really told, that you had never confided in anyone. And yet your events for Moms and Girls are called Secret Keeper Girls. So so bridge that for me. So why why that title and, and how does all of that relate? Well, Secret Keeper Girl, the name really came out of the heart that I had for girls to keep the secrets of true beauty and modesty alive for the whole girl world. So there are truths about true beauty that the world slaughters every day with Photoshop and filters and all this kind of stuff, right? That's not really beautiful. I, it is appealing to us, but it's not what the definition of beauty is because it's not real. <laughs> to me, it has to be real to be beautiful, right? And so these poreless faces, there's no pores in these women, let alone zits, right? That's not real. And so I want girls to recognize that that's not real, and I want them to keep true beauty alive. That doesn't matter what size she is, what color she is, what color her hair is, whether it's straight or curly. Like, the being unique and different, that's what's beautiful, according to God's Word in Song of Solomon. And so I wanted to keep that alive, but I also wanted to keep alive the secret of modesty and the power of it. We have this special power to allow people to see our inner workings, our good works, and I don't, I, you know, in Secret Keeper Girl, the, the book, the core book for our ministry, I talk about how you can meet two twins. They can look identical. And if one of them is mean and snarly and selfish, and the other one is giving and gentle and kind, it's so interesting that the first time you see them, they, they look very much the same. But the one with the internal beauty becomes more appealing, more beautiful to you as the one with all those ugly character traits becomes less beautiful to you. Everybody's met someone like that where they make a first impression and then you're like, oh, they're much more beautiful than I realized. Oh, they're not so beautiful after all. What is inside of us is really what um, ultimately determines how people perceive us. And I want the girls to keep that secret alive for all the girl world. That's great. Right back to the interview with Dana Gresh, but first this, if you want to make a difference in the world, do something for a child in need that makes a world of difference through Compassion International. Just like that, we're officially into the last lap of the year. 2018, where are you going so fast? I'm looking back on the things I said back in January that I wanted to get accomplished this year, and I'm revving up to finish the year strong, and you can too. You started out the year wanting to make a difference, make an impact on the world, and you can. For just a little over a dollar a day, you can provide medical, educational, and spiritual care for a child in need through Compassion International. Go to Compassion.com slash AllMomDoes and finish the year strong by making a world of difference in the life of a child. So now you have books and events and online experiences, as, as we've referenced for parents and kids, and you've got a big upcoming tour for Secret Keeper Girl. So what can a mom expect if she signs up her daughter for Secret Keeper Girl? What are they going to experience when they come to one of these events? Well, I like to say that it's the most fun a mom and daughter are ever going to have digging into God's Word together. We're going to go deep. I don't believe that 8 to 12-year-old girls 
need mushy spiritual food. They are capable of digesting deep spiritual meat. So the content is mature, but very age appropriate. And we're going to go to deep places. But we're also going to worship the Lord with my live worship team. We're going to have dance off contests and laugh ourselves silly. Um, in this particular program, we have an audience camera that shows up at really fun and conspicuous times. So uh, there's lots of laughter and humor. Um, you just get closer to each other. You know, I, I believe that God opens our hearts through laughter and fun. And then we go in with that deep spiritual meat while that heart is open and we lay it in that spot and plant beautiful truths. Moms walk away every night saying, I got closer to my daughter in these two and a half hours than I have in the last two months. Because we're constantly putting the conversation. We're saying, okay, now look at your mom and talk about that. Hey, look at your mom and ask her this. We're putting mom in the driver's seat because of that parent-child connectedness, believing and being convicted that the most important thing that's happening that night is what's happening between mom and daughter. And what do you ideally want to see on the other side of mom and daughter attending one of these events? Sort of what's the, what's the ideal follow-up? You know, once they've gone, they've had a great time, they've created connection. How do you propel that momentum forward into the coming days and weeks and months? Yeah, well, we have created a lot of resources with one purpose in mind, creating mother-daughter connecting experiences. As a, Again, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm happy to do it if it changes someone's parenting skills today. If you just are with your daughter one-on-one -on -one, talking about important topics, that parent-child connectedness will translate into a safety mechanism for her little spirit and her heart through her whole life. And so all of our resources, we have several eight great date kits. And they're just eight dates. They're planned. All you have to do is like, they're very easy to put together. Schedule it, put it on your calendar. And maybe a month from now or a week from now or two months from now, you and your daughter have another connecting experience. We have all the different topics, boy craziness, frenemies, mean girls, body image issues, all that stuff. And so we really encourage moms to leave with those resources. Um, um, obviously, they can do it without resources, but I find as a mom, sometimes a resource really helps me to be disciplined and more structured about how I create together time with my kids. So Dana, tell us in this Me Too movement era that is so important that we are having uh, really, I think, a very powerful exposure of a lot of the sexism, a lot of the victimization that has gone on in years past. How do we take the content that you have so carefully and prayerfully developed and make sure that people aren't sort of twisting it to almost sound like victim blaming when we talk about modesty, things like that. How do we stay in that place where your message of girls really understanding true beauty, of avoiding body shaming, of, of walking in an attitude of modesty, how do we keep that empowering versus judging? Because I know sometimes when we bring these topics up and we are talking about God's best, then all of a sudden it can get all twisted around and it can sound like we're blaming people when that's not the intent at all. No. And our ministry is super careful about how we word things. That's why we don't have like rules about how long a skirt should be or shorts should be. We have things, we call them our truth or bear fashion tests and they're really subjective. They're just putting questions in the girl's heart about, am I in a position of power so that people are seeing the inside of me? Um, I, you, the, the saddest thing for me about the Me Too movement is how many women and girls have spent so many years hiding deep, dark, sad secrets. And what we do at Secret Keeper Girl is we open the conversation to these very difficult topics. I have been in the lobby at my Secret Keeper Girl event where moms and daughters come out in the middle of the event because the little girl, because we're in that space of talking about what's appropriate and talking about you are beautiful and you are treasured and you are worth something. And that opens a little girl's heart to confess to her mom that she has been a victim. And so what I, what I have seen is that we are creating the space for girls to get the help they need much faster. The other thing we're doing is creating confidence in girls that they know they're valuable. They know they're worth something. And when you know your value and you know you're worth something, you are much more likely to stand up to someone and to say no when they're trying to hurt you and take advantage and victimize you. And so I'm really proud of the dialogue that we've created as a ministry. It hasn't been easy. We've had lots of um, 
criticism, some of it useful, much of it um, just because anytime you open up the Bible and talk about God's definition of womanhood, that you're, you're kind of a target for some of these some some critics that really don't want to help and solve the problem. They just want to hate. But I'm really happy that even in that in those situations, we read every email and we say, how can we make this message better? How can we make this message safer? Is there something we need to change about the way we're communicating? I'm very mindful that women need protected. I'm also very mindful that the greatest protection is empowering them. And so we try to do that at every Secret Keeper Girl event and with every resource. All right. Well, Dana, thank you so much for your time today and for speaking into such an important topic on how we need to be equipping our kids and making sure we are having those deep conversations about all things when it comes to sexual morality, about the choices that they're making, and to make sure that we're creating those conversation lanes so they can open up to us. So, Dana, thank you so much for all the work you do and all that you are doing for a a new generation of, of moms and daughters. My pleasure. Thank you, friend. Head to secretkeepergirl.com to see when Dana and her team are coming to your city. And for our listeners in the Pacific Northwest, including the Seattle area, Dana has a whole bunch of dates and cities in your area in October. So be sure and check that out and get your tickets. I'd love to connect with you on social media. I love me some Instagram and I'm on all the places. Facebook and Twitter is Julie Lyles Carr. Check out allmomdoes.com and allmomdoes on the socials. It's a dynamic community of bloggers and moms just just like you, wrestling with the same things, looking for ideas and inspiration, and you'll find all kinds of great resources and laughs and friends at All Mom Does. Let's give some love to Donna Toady, our awesome producer, and to Rebecca Beckett, our fearless content coordinator, who works so hard to make sure all these great episodes make it to you each week. And do us a favor and subscribe and share and give us a shiny five-star rating and review. That helps us get the word out to others about the podcast, and we really appreciate your help with that. Coming up next week, he's one of the funniest people I know. And he'll have you laughing until you cry and crying until you laugh. And once you hear our conversation, you'll understand exactly what I mean. He is a talented comedian, and he's more than funny. Michael Jr. joins me next week on the Modern Motherhood Podcast. <music>